we could start yeah <clears throat> good evening everyone warm welcome from council of architecture sua social reads number 5 today we are glad to have architect rahul mehrotra on our this platform sua social reads and today's topic is the city in books a 30 year trajectory on writing on urbanism so architect rahul mehrotra we are really glad we are very happy to have you on this platform and i again once again welcome you on the behalf of council of architecture and sua social platform on this sua social reads so welcome thank you ji thank you now over to professor durganan please initiate the dialogue and let us see. okay thank you thank you thank you, you sapna ji and thank you rahul for consenting to participate in the coa social forum which has today a reach from india to even southeast asia south africa and as far as new zealand now so good evening everybody and we look forward to this uh, presentation and a dialogue by professor rahul merotra and he's presenting a very different set of ideas today uh while the forum was created to discuss books uh rahul suggested that we would rather look at a 30 year trajectory of writing on urbanism and uh, i think that could open up some very new directions and while <clears throat> the book that has been referred to in the poster does permanence matter and ephemeral urbanism is one of the uh anchors of this conversation uh rahul tells us that this conversation and this presentation will really span a much broader uh gamut the presentation will focus on books authored and co-authored by rahul over the last 30 years the focus of the discussion will be books on city and urbanism and more broadly uh <clears throat> culminate with the idea of ephemeral urbanism uh with a particular reading of the city in india that merotra has researched and written about concurrently and importantly i would say as part of his practice so there is a very close synergy between uh pedagogy and practice in in rahul's search which has inspired several and i think we are looking for that within this uh, so i invite rahul now to present to us and thank you rahul once again for consenting to participate in our forum Thank you, Sapna Ji, and thank you, Durga Nand. Thank you to the Council of Architecture uh, for this invitation. It's been, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting when we started this conversation, Durga Nand, and you said, um, you know, talk about ephemeral urbanism. And I, as we started our email exchange, I realized that this might be a good occasion for me, really, out of my own uh, compulsions, uh, to try to reflect on. uh where what did ephemeral urbanism even come out of and why are we why are we culminating with this and why did you pick this up and so therefore i <clears throat> dwelled into my own archive uh in a way to search for uh, what might be that trajectory and thank you for agreeing to actually expand it uh, to that broader uh, you know question so with that i'm going to um, just share my screen uh so that we can um, actually dwell into this uh and there we go you can see it yes we can see it okay fine it's visible thank you okay <clears throat> so you know what i'm going to share today with you all is uh, uh 30 years of writing about the city and it's a trajectory about both cities and about architecture in india and cities more particularly about bombay for me there's always been a blur that has existed between the role of the architect the urban designer the planner uh, i studied urban design and i always thought urban design was the kind of bridge practice between architecture and planning and so a lot of the work and actually the books have been very instrumental in trying to understand what those sort of crossovers were thus the shifting role uh, is i think also a factor that gives us agency as architects uh, uh and in particular conditions like india for me working in mumbai particularly 
Uh, and one gains a lot of traction actually in the way one can think about the problem, pick up the problem using the mode, using um, you know, books as a media uh, to explore these and more importantly, to understand the context even more deeply. And I think this idea uh, for me is a very important one, which is, uh, you know, uh, what is, uh, you know, the context and how do you actually understand the context? And so the books also, uh, I think, allow us to, uh, to, to dwell into the complexity because every project becomes complex. And therefore, uh, and especially in the public realm, if you're actually intervening then, uh, and uh, what happens is actors uh, that are involved in the process of building actually become very differentiated. And hence the building of constituencies becomes very critical. And this relates to the idea of the client, which I will come to in the course of the talk. But the notion of constituency, which is who you're building for, why you're building for, it can only occur if you understand uh, the context that you're in. Uh, and so, you know, research writing becomes, I think, a very important platform to do that. And uh, at least in our own trajectory, and that's why here I use the word collaborations, research and advocacy, these have become, you know, these have included, actually what I'm gonna show you have included books, a lot of them collaboratively done. And that's why it's collaborations. Uh, a lot of them across the medium. Some are serious, I would say academic books, some are uh, serious reflections, some are catalogs. Um, uh, uh, brochures. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to show you too many brochures, but catalogs, because these becomes, become what I call instruments of advocacy. You know, we as architects often say we're going to, you know, we, we, we pretend or we think or we want to be advocates, right? Uh, and of course, some of us can do that. Uh, some of us can't. But I think a very important role that we are prepared in our training to do is to create the instruments of advocacy. And I think books, which come out of research, books become a form of disseminating those ideas, are critical instruments of, uh, of, of, of uh, advocacy. And so we have to also uh, look at it in, 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 in that way, in a way that we can actually engage with a multifaceted set of issues in these contexts, in the locality we work in, in the city <clears throat> we work in, uh, and we begin to therefore understand the context. Uh, and so, what I'm going to also show you, many of these things are uh, things, as I said, uh, which became our kind of central uh, obsession uh, about Bombay's urban theory, architectural theory, uh, uh, archiving kind of compulsions uh, that we had. Uh, and these were uh, the first lot, which I'm going to show you were in collaboration. And I kind of attribute much of my interest in this realm uh, to my friend Sharda, the late Sharda Devedi, uh, who, with, in partnership with whom and in partnership with the Urban Design Research Institute, was the, the foundation uh, in terms of uh, understanding, you know, what I call the context of the context. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, and, and, and the UDRI, the Urban Design Research Institute, was actually at one point physically for many years, for about 10 years, physically situated in our studio. And so, therefore, uh, those other interests uh, in research and advocacy at the level of the city began to seep also into the project, project uh, into the practice. Uh, and uh, so a lot of these that I'm also gonna show you were formerly Urban Design Research Institute publications and were again clearly in, intended as instruments of advocacy under the umbrella of this kind of institutional structure. But I think most importantly for me in, in retrospect, uh, Publications became a way of creating partnerships, collaborations, friendships, uh, which I think is the, the most important dimension of this endeavor or this part of our practice that I, I think treasure, uh, because it kept conversations alive on issues at hand and engagement with the work we were doing. Similarly, these publications then really, over this time, go out into the world beyond the project they were intended to as instruments of advocacy and have a life of their own. Uh, and you know, this is after 30 years, one actually realizes it when one meets students or meets people who I haven't known, but they have known me and now I get to know them through these publications and books which have gone and actually had their own life. But most critically, uh, in hindsight, they allowed us to expand, I would call our sphere of influence. Uh, and equipped us to actually even speculate about the future, 
simultaneously creating an archive of the present. Uh, and this interrelationship through books between the present and a speculative future is critical. You know, architects, I think, you know, we, we rely, we actually live in the past, you know, real estate brokers or real estate um, developers, um, uh, politicians, they live in the future. I mean, they are already, they're, they're situated 10 years ahead trying to see their gains or what they might influence at that time. We, because our precedents are all the past, uh, we tend to have more than a foot in the past. And I think using books as an instrument, as a bridge uh, to be situated and to capture the past, but also speculate about the future, uh, uh, the past and the present, I'm sorry, and speculate about the future is I think very important. The act of archiving, reflecting, as well as simultaneously speculating and being propositional are critical for us to gain agency as a profession because if we continue to be only critical without being propositional, no one's gonna take us seriously. For by committing in writing, drawing, our speculations or even our discerning the patterns that surround us, give us agency as professionals in society. If we do not have that agency or we find ways to establish that agency, we will break down as a profession. And therefore I think again, books, and I'm glad this uh, council of um, the series that the Council of Architecture is doing uh, on books is very, very important because it becomes, books become a very research and by extension books become a very important platform for us as a profession to keep our agency in society and we shouldn't forget that. And I mean, exhibitions are another forum for the construction of this agency and forming constituencies, giving traction to ourselves as architects in society. The format of the exhibition, for example, is quite different from that of the book because it forces us to distill our research, to communicate it to the world outside our profession, outside the studio, outside the academy often. And they offer a venue where different media can be easily deployed. Of course, books that can't be done so easily, but books actually have a very important intersection with these other forms of dissemination. But of course, I'm not gonna go into these exhibition, exhibitions, but I'm gonna rather share with you a trajectory of writing over the last 30 years. And in some places, we'll spend a few minutes to also show how aspects of practice intersect where this all becomes part of the same practice more broadly. So I'm not gonna go into any book in detail. This you can do at your pleasure, uh, but I'm gonna at some moments try to show you what these intersections uh, might be. Uh, and what I've not done is not organize this chronologically, that would have been boring, but rather thematically, because many of these things, at least in my head, existed simultaneously, but they found life at different moments through different opportunities, uh, through other compulsions, which forced one uh, to distill these thoughts uh, more systematically, whether it was an opportunity to publish something, opportunity to exhibit something, opportunity in my own teaching that propelled me to write about something. Uh, but they kind of have simultaneously existed in my mind and therefore I chose not to organize it uh, chronologically. So let me now just take you through this 30 years uh, journey. <clears throat> I start with the essence of why one even wanted to do these books, which was to really understand the context of the context. As I say, the context is what we architects are taught to do. We you know, discern climate and materiality. We look at the site. Uh, the more ambitious ones, they begin to excavate embedded histories uh, in a site um, and begin to understand it in even more compelling ways. But when you take the context, this, however your broadest definition of that context and the site is, uh, as they say, site matters and so does context matters. Uh, and you place that in its context, which is a context of economic, socio-political questions, cultural questions, many, many uh, intangible and moving parts, then the intersection between your understanding of a particular context and its context is what I think produces the most important, potent, uh, instrumental uh, moments of, uh, of intervention for us as architects and urban designers and planners. And so understanding the context of the context is what's really driven us to write these books. Uh, <clears throat> I just sort of took the books and I began to, as I was saying to Durgananda earlier, uh, you know, unpack them in families of things. And I, I discovered that really there are many families and subfamilies, but clearly one family of books was books on Mumbai or Bombay, Mumbai, uh, and then there was a whole family of books on urbanism. And then there are a family of books on architecture and things which I'll come to. 
But I think by organizing it for me, at least thematically, I began to see uh, many intersections, which is what I'm going to try uh, to kind of discern for you. So if you look at the books on Mumbai, there were many more, but uh, <clears throat> these were, I think, some critical ones. Uh, you know, cities within, these were all done with Sharda Devedi, and it was a wonderful partnership, except for the Bombay to Mumbai. That was a book, um, which is also, to my mind, a very important book, uh, which was done for Marg Magazine to celebrate 50 years. And because Marg Magazine, which was Modern Architects Research Group, started in Bombay, uh, they decided to dedicate it to the city of Bombay. And together with Firoza Godrej and Pauline Rohatgi, I was one of the editors. And so the three of us actually edited three sections in it, which came together as a book. But it was clearly a collaborative uh, process. Uh, and But the others were all with Sharda Devedi, and they all came out of, you know, very interesting reasons and causes. Um, you know, the cities within was the first one, which actually was an attempt to understand a broader kind of history of the city, but, but from the perspective of architecture and urban form. And then that made us realize there were so many important aspects that were supposed to, could be books by themselves. And so, they were different formats. I mean, the Bombay Deco, I mean, we would have called it Mumbai Deco, so you can tell how old it is, uh, was perhaps one of the earliest books on Bombay's Art Deco architecture and a real catalog. Uh, I see many things have spun out of it now uh, as Art Deco societies and activism. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting and I'm, it, it pleases me to see that because in a sense, this is what I meant. Books go out into the world and they have a life of their own and they go even beyond the authors uh, where the authors are sometimes not even acknowledged uh, as the material propels itself but that is a good thing because i think it does have an impact in 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 in, in society uh, and then you know the city icon is an archive of the victoria terminus it has from the railways all the archival drawings and this book came out of just sharda uh, stumbling upon the archives and taking me there and saying, look at these drawings. And before we knew it, we had the permission of the railways to compile it and tell the story of the building through the drawings. Uh, and, uh, you know, and each one of these therefore have a story anchoring a city line is about the history of the railway system in Bombay and Mumbai, because, you know, it's so much of the DNA of the city that we felt its history was important to tell. Um, and, you know, the conservation after legislation is a reflection on what happened when we had conservation. And the Fort Walks is a walking tour of the Fort area, which then became a handbook for many un young architects who actually started doing it professionally, uh, had websites and took people on walking tours and, you know, actually made some income from it. So each of these go out in the world in different ways and they have their own lives. One of the earliest ones and one of my favorite ones is this book called the Fort Precinct in Mumbai, a conservation of an image center, or conserving an image center. And it's it's kind of between a book and a, a detailed catalog. It has you know 20 maps and a catalog of 300 conservation worthy buildings and essays and history of the fort area. It came out of an international conference, but it truly became an instrument for advocacy because it was this document uh, which also included what bylaws could be modified for conservation actually opened up the urban conservation debate because Bombay had had a listing of buildings, but it hadn't been pitched as a narrative of urban conservation. And it's only at the level of urban conservation that one can actually write guidelines uh, and influence form. Uh, and that led to the first uh, heritage regulations of, uh, of Bombay, of Greater Bombay in 1995. Uh, and uh, it was an important piece of legislation which then got replicated in many uh, other cities. And of course, there were many people involved in this, but this book I think was very important, at least in retrospectively, in shifting the di di discussion from just listing individual buildings and trying to craft a legislation around that versus looking at areas for conservation and crafting a legislation around that. Quite different because you can get into all sorts of other sorts of issues, which led to the creation of these precincts and sub precincts uh, and all of that. And you know, it becomes an important question in post colonial societies where the custodians, which is us as a culture, are quite different from the creators of that environment. Uh, it becomes very complicated. And so you get into questions of how you can also construct cultural significance. Cultural significance is not a static category. So those those are the kinds of issues that kind of got di discussed as a result that was triggered out of that kind of uh, research. And that's what led 
to us formulating um, uh, you know, these districts, giving the districts characters based on what the contemporary engines might be, which might drive the conservation process. These are all maps that kind of came out of that book and of the legislation. And it propelled us further uh, to actually organize citizens groups, work with other people to formulate these associations. I mean, you know, and, and therefore then get involved really in the conservation project itself. On the side with Sharda, you know, we were, I would say almost planting stories like this, which is when I said speculation, uh, this is before that even became the Kala Ghoda Art Festival or became Kala Ghoda. We wrote this kind of uh, op-ed in the Times of India where we were saying the Kala Ghoda is supposed to become the center of an art district, just showing and arguing uh, in just a little newspaper article because we had seen the patterns that were possible there. Uh, and so then it became a way of distilling from those books things that we had seen as emergent patterns around us and making them propositional, which is what I think led to the art district, the forming of the art district, the idea of the festival, the improvements that went with it. Uh, this is, of course, a painting of by Hussein uh, of his imagination of the Kala Ghoda, which was then auctioned. Uh, so it led to a kind of series of what I would call really activism. Uh, which came out of those instruments of advocacy. If we didn't have those instruments of advocacy, we would be, you know, as I say, we would have uh, the, the will to act, but really not knowing what to do. Uh, and often, you know, that happens. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, if advocacy doesn't go with the instruments for advocacy, which I think we as architects are really well prepared to, uh, to engage in, uh, it, you actually undermine the possibilities and uh, that occurred. And sometimes these windows open only once. And of course, it led to physical improvement. It led to, uh, you know, appointing, in this case, Abha Narayan to do the conservation of this grade one building for Elphinstone. So here I was playing the role uh, with the Kalaghoda Association of a client, uh, because, you know, I was part of the patrons of the Kalaghoda Association that were now appointing architects. Uh, and so again, one had then a much higher or a more macro view of the problem and one wasn't involved just in the nitty gritty of, uh, of actual conservation because one was engaged with these sort of broader patterns that we were trying to establish there. And I can attribute those only to the fact that one had written about it, speculated about it uh, and researched about it, which gave one the advantage of that kind of speculation. It also, of course, led to seeing other possibilities. And this is a case where the museum, uh, you know, which had this large uh, <clears throat> warehouse, which was 50,000 square feet of uh, land ex uh, of space, except for a natural history museum on the ground floor. And we began to situate it in the context of the Kala Ghoda Association's uh, precinct. And we said, my God, you can open that up uh, for an art uh, uh, gallery and art related spaces. And of course, a museum had been thinking about it, but the festival, I think, tipped it over. Kalpana Desai was the director then, which then Mr. Mukherjee you know, took over. Uh, and we actually converted it uh, through measure drawings, uh, through opening that warehouse. What you see in gray uh, are the two interventions, which was a veranda for circulation and a staircase internally in a light shaft. Uh, which completely transformed the space uh, to make it much, much more usable. But from a conservation perspective, because it was interesting, this was also the time because of the legislation that had come through, I was also on the conservation or the heritage committee as they call it. And so therefore it was very almost awkward because being part of the heritage committee, one had to step out of all the meetings when this project was being discussed. And this was in some ways brave that it was a contemporary intervention in a grade one building. Uh, and how, and therefore it was done as a separate, uh, you can see the column is separate from the wall because it could be reversed. And the reversibility is I think what tipped the arguments uh, in some ways. And similarly, we went on to do a visitor center there, which again uh, uh, took the same attitude of reversibility, although it was contemporary. Uh, uh, and, and I believe because one was writing about all of this, one was speaking about this with I would say now I can say after 30 years, I couldn't have said this 15 years ago, with some authority uh, that you actually had a, a voice uh, with the constituency that had now been built around this set of issues. So we had a Kala Ghoda Association, we had a heritage committee uh, through the writing and the research. We were also part and instrumental of the formation of many of those things. And therefore it also gave us the agency as architects to make interventions, which I believe were sensitive 
uh, which were contemporary, sensitive, but also incorporated notions like reversibility. So it left it open for a next generation. It wasn't arrogant in saying that this is the absolute uh, solution. Uh, and so uh, those came out of that. And of course, that extended in our interest in the buildings in the Kalaghore area. And we did this exhibition, and this is the catalog of the exhibition. Uh, Mark Publications did it. It was, again, under the auspices of the Urban Design Research Institute, and it was the buildings of the Kala Ghoda. And where we said that, look, people had seen these buildings, but no one knows these buildings in plan. And so we actually measured through all the buildings in the Kala Ghoda area, and this catalog has the plans, the elevations, the sections of these buildings. So it takes the understanding of what is otherwise emotive, nostalgic, about these buildings, which is just a visual understanding, to understanding the logic, the spatial logic of these buildings, because we were also being strategic because we were being ambitious. It didn't happen finally for various bureaucratic reasons, but we were being very ambitious that maybe the Elphinstone College yard, if we can see it spatially, can become an extension as space for the festival. It can be where performances occur in the quiet of a quad. Of course, these ideas were floated, but for various reasons didn't happen or maybe they will happen in the future. But the idea of this book was not only to document uh, the buildings of the Kala Ghoda, but actually to see them spatially uh, in terms of plan. And then this, of course, extended. We did a, a, a special catalog to celebrate. I think it was might have been the 50 years of the Jahangir Art Gallery uh, and its history. Uh, we looked at archival images. We and you know it was also a project that I was doing. Or I, I had done uh, five years or ten years earlier. So one knew the building very intimately. And when we got this opportunity, we actually did a catalog on that specific building. And so many buildings in this historic district then got these catalogs like archives, and they have plans, sections, elevations, archival images, the history of who the patrons were, what supported an uh, institution like this to occur. Some of these got also translated, in this case, the fort walks into Marathi. As an extension of this was also a series of catalogs uh, which were propositional uh, uh, and again done under the auspicious of the UDRI. So when we did the Ford district, we started forming the associations. We felt that each of these associations, whether it's the art district, the banking district, the tourist district, should have their own master plan, so to speak. And so these are guiding documents which outline the important aspects of the significance of these places, but also speculate about how one can construct a new significance. So constructing a tourist district is constructing a new significance, taking into consideration the components that already exist in the district, which is tourism related, right? The art district was the same thing. It wasn't historically an art district, but in the contemporary engines, there happen to be art spaces and who have a vested interest in actually maintaining and conserving that area and keeping the illusion of the architecture intact while draining the ideological symbolism that might exist in those colonial buildings. And so these were done <clears throat> as part of, well, I was director of the Urban Design Research Institute, but under the umbrella of the Urban Design Research Institute. So all of these had many people collaborating uh, and um, were intended as instruments of advocacy, right? Which is what our training prepares us for. And then, you know, 10, 15 years after we had got the legislation through, we had uh, done all these sort of art districts and, you know, banking districts, et cetera. Uh, with Abha Narayan, uh, I organized a conference, again, uh, with, under the auspicious of the Urban Design Research Institute, which was a very interesting, not very well-known conference, uh, which was looking at conservation after legislation, really evaluating did legislation have an impact in what we managed on the ground. Uh, and uh, this is a very important document, which again, not many people know about, which is a collection of papers, which is a reflection on what legislation meant, uh, didn't mean, uh, and how we can reflect about it. Uh, and uh, it's again, one of the less known books. Another book we did, uh, which came out of a conference was the Public Spaces of Bombay, and it was again a UDRI conference. And this was an important book because it it bought, it was a book which captured for the first time the idea of the Perel Milllands and its potential in the future uh, and what might happen there and how it could be safeguarded. And actually uh, in the book at the end, there is a kind of recap on that, that conversation. Uh, and that led to DT Joseph, who was the urban development secretary there, 
creating the Charles Courier Commission uh, to look at the Middle Lands. And that came out of the discussions and Kapadia and Charles Courier presented here and they presented uh, the idea for the Middle Lands, which became controversial. There was a lot of discussion, but it led to the commission being appointed. Uh, and so again, these become therefore, as I say, instruments uh, of, uh, of, of advocacy. Uh, and they become important. This is Bombay to Mumbai, which I've spoken about. So that is really, you know, the collection of books on, on Bombay. Let me move to architecture now, because I think this is uh, very critical. And these are two books that for me are complementary. Uh, one was a book that one did in the 1990s, uh, where Kenneth Frampton was a general editor for uh, 10 volumes, uh, which covered uh, canonical works around the globe. Uh, and he asked me to be his volume editor for the South Asia volume. Uh, and I had two very uh, uh, able uh, associates work with me on it, uh, Preeti Goel and Shilpa Ranade, uh, who were both at the studio at that time. And like I said, because the Urban Design Research Institute, they, all this blur between architect, I mean, research and practice was quite amazing. And we compiled together in this book, 100 canonical works from South Asia. Uh, and uh, it in, we had an advisory board that had architects from each country in South Asia. So it was, you know, again, it was an expansion of what one's own view about architecture in India was. And, you know, to see things that were happening in Sri Lanka, to be introduced to a whole landscape there, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And this is in 1990, uh, you know, in the 90, mid 1990s, it was finished by Sorry, it was in 95, 96 to 2000 because it, it ended 100 years of architecture. Uh, but it created a wonderful network for us in South Asia, which we've continued to build on. Uh, and it also opened up for me, uh, at least the understanding that the thing about South Asia is its pluralism, but its multiplicity of modes of practice, which is the idea that finally drove the book on architecture uh, in India since uh, 1990. And this book for me was, is perhaps very important because it allowed a kind of, in 1990s also when we started our practice, and this is a book where one wore the hat of a critic and wrote about what had, I had seen happening around me, but didn't include our practice at all. There was no reference to our buildings. You won't even know we are practitioners if you read the book. <clears throat> but what emerged from this book was a very clear understanding for me that, that there are different modes of practice that occur simultaneously. And this is how I had in some simplistic way, perhaps uh, categorize them just for clarity, uh, because you know the, the idea was to open this up for potential, uh, how people who patronize architecture might see it, students of architecture. It wasn't intended to be purely academic and you know, uh, um, uh, perhaps dense in some ways, but it was really the impulse was to communicate it. So there's a simplification here. Uh, but it allowed one to see how these modes of practice actually simultaneously exist in India. Uh, and we don't recognize it. And actually, what I call global practice and what I call counter modernism are probably building the biggest buildings in the country uh, today, all the way from Akshar Dam to large IT campuses. And these actually defeat everything we as a community of architects through the Council of Architecture, the Indian Institute of Architects, put value on for architecture. These are the two ends of the spectrum we actually criticize, but they are building the most. And my argument was, unless you recognize them, you can't even begin to engage with that conversation. And so, you know, it, it for some architects, it was um, problematic that one had even celebrated this. And I think others uh, saw this much more uh, positively. And it also kind of asked the fundamental question, which is the architecture practice versus the practice of architecture. That means one has to also think about how our practices are formulated. That was really the provocation. There were two or three major provocations in that book. One provocation in this book was, if you remove the lens of modernism, what do you see in the landscape in India since 1990, once we liberalized our economy? Uh, because we have always looked at architecture through the lens of modernism. Uh, rightly so, I think that's been an important project, but actually a bulk of stuff that's happening, buildings that are being built, don't fit in that canon. And therefore it's important to see it, to engage with either discerning its value or being critical of it, right? Um, and the other thing that sort of emerged was the notion of these uh, uh, models of practice and the kind of protocols they fall. This led to a very important project. And uh, again, uh, friendships, uh, 
with Kaiwan and Ranjit Hoskote, Kaiwan Mehta and Ranjit Hoskote. And, you know, we, of course, had been friends for a long time, but suddenly the book on architecture in India triggered off uh, us in public forums discussing that book in many dimensions. And that organically led uh, to the idea of doing a major exhibition on the state of architecture in India. And this, as you know, was uh, at the NGMA. It was a large exhibition. It's an exhibition I wish we had traveled and I wish maybe at some point uh, an institution like the Council of Architecture can take over because it's an incredible archive uh, uh, through the research of buildings. Uh, and one of the things that we did here was we, and this made, made, made a lot of enemies for us, is we said that we won't include the architecture of indulgence. That means we won't include single family homes and weekend houses and farmhouses and boutique hotels. Let's look at what most people in the country use and let's force ourselves to come up with a catalog or a collection of where architecture is really instrumental in our society from that perspective, not just for the 1% of society. And there were about 90 speakers uh, through the exhibition, some in the form of conferences, of course, and that's bunches of 10 and 12, but sometimes individual speakers. And this then became a catalog because this became the conversation uh, around architecture, which we then made as a two volume catalog on the state of architecture in India. One was on all the buildings, the trajectory, um, all of that. And the other was on all the conversations. Uh, and, you know, it's a two volume set, which really captures um, architecture in India up to, uh, you know, from 1990 in this case uh, to 2016. So say about 25 years. Of course, many things came out of it. And one of the things, and that's why I have this one image, uh, is what was central to it is we took a stock of what was written on, on architecture in India. And, uh, you know, whether they were monographs and we did this from 1950s, uh, you know, onwards. And, and also what's interesting is this graph that you see at the back, which is one of the research that came out and the columns that you see of names uh, are the schools of architecture. And you see, you know, in the beginning of our, at our independence, a couple of schools of architecture and going up to the 400 and whatever, 20, 60 plus, I uh, forget the actual number. Uh, and it's mind blowing because the, what also grows after 1990 is the blue line, which is the real estate industry. And what is interesting is this growth of schools is proportionate to the growth of the real estate industry as an organized sector. And this is bizarre because actually the, number of architecture schools should be inversely proportional to the growth of real estate as an industry because when real estate grows as an organized sector it actually employs less architects now i mean we can discuss this it can be a controversial question but for me this was really mind-blowing to understand that and i think for me that explains why students can't get internships today why you know we have more architects than we seemingly need you can again argue that and say no we need to build much more but if you recognize the models of other practices you know architects are marginal to this society and we have to find ways that we can be more useful uh, and so these are things that just came out of uh, the conversation, some controversial, some I might not even be able to take to their logical conclusion. But the idea is it becomes a platform, the book, the catalog becomes a platform for us to open up these conversations. And of course, it also made us see how the spine of architectural awareness, that lens of modernism was this particular spine with a new economy, you have a completely different spine with the new towns that will grow, you'll have completely different protocols and processes in these zones, completely different because the kind of model of practice through the modernist sort of tenant that started in Chandigarh and Ahmedabad and Bombay, went to Goa, Pondicherry, is quite different from how things are being built now within the new economy, which is vendor driven, which is you know, what I call the architecture of impatient capital. Anyway, this led us as an, you know, when, when, we, when, we, when we eliminated the architecture of indulgence, uh, the thing that focused our attention for Kaiwan, Ranjit and me was housing and why, and to ask the question, why are we not engaged enough in housing any longer? Of course, there are many reasons, including the organized sector of the real estate, but this became an exhibition called the State of Housing, which has been traveling. It went to Ahmedabad, Bangalore. We're hoping to take it to Calcutta. And it was a documentation of 80 uh, housing types, uh, actual projects and understanding them in very much detail 
of how they were made, who patronized it, what are the economic models, what are the income groups that uh, you know, uh, benefited from it, et cetera. And this again, uh, with Kaivan, Mehta and Ranjit, uh, landed up in two catalogs. Uh, one was a catalog of uh, all the conversations that happened through that uh, six months or four months or five months. There were two major conferences, there were lecture series, all of that has been captured here. So it captures the conversations about the state of housing through government, through private developers, through architects, through academics, uh, et cetera. Uh, and the other was a catalog of the 80 types that we studied, the case studies, so to speak. So it becomes a catalog of case studies, which is another pedagogical tool, uh, which I think we have to take much more seriously. The amount of work that happens in the schools of architecture around the country. I mean, you know, the Louis Kahn trophy captures that in some ways, but it doesn't even become a book. Uh, it, 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 it's an exhibition and it's ephemeral after that. Uh, I think we have to create platforms where we mine this knowledge because again, it is by creating these formats that we'll have agency as architects in society uh, because it will create constituencies around those books and those documents. And I think we need to really take that seriously. My most important learning uh, from uh, this uh, whole exercise of the architecture bit was that we have to look at the client in a much more nuanced way because clients are actually patron clients, and every project has this. They're patron clients, they're operational clients, and they're user clients. We often align with one of those. Uh, in a single family house, they collapse into one, and that's why those projects become frictionless, uh, or maximum we have to deal with a couple, let's say. But then in a government project, sometimes the patron client, which might be the chief minister, has almost no connection with the public works department that is the operational client, or the user that might be a very low income group that benefits from the project. And the architect's role becomes very nuanced here. And I think by breaking this down into models of practice, understanding how, what are the modes of instruction or the protocols and processes within each of those modes of practice allowed us to begin to unpack and see this in a much more nuanced way. And ever since that happened for me, even on my own practice and my own projects, I see these relationships and you realize where you intervene, what are the relationships and the connections you have to make, it actually makes it much more instrumental for you as an architect too. Going back to conservation, that conservation also took us into doing bigger projects. And this was a conservation master plan we made for the Taj Mahal, which involved, uh, we made uh, Bernard Fielden the chair of our committee. We made a working group. Uh, we had many architects involved here. We had institutions like the Getty, the Archaeological Survey of India. I mean, again, this is a lecture in itself, uh, but we also, you know, uh, looked at components. We, this was a whole site management plan, including measure drawings, including uh, defect, I mean, drawings, uh, you know, showing um, uh, on different components, uh, the uh, things that needed conservation and inventory of all of that, actual conservation work in some areas, uh, visitor center, looking at traditional practices and using them and actually conserving parts of the Taj Mahal complex, not the Taj Mahal itself, but the Taj Mahal complex. And of course, this is a government run thing with governments change, they stop the project, it goes, but you know, this got conserved. We also expanded our view on what the cons uh, Taj Mahal was, uh, inspired by works of scholars like Ebba Koch, looking at the garden across, looking at the larger precinct, looking at what the deformations in the garden have been, what is authentic, what is not authentic, uh, and then also looking at historical documents of what the riverfront was, which was a mind-blowing uh, conception where the river actually had 30, over 30 pleasure gardens along it, and the Taj was only one. These pleasure gardens became mausoleums because that was the only loophole in Mughal law where people could uh, ask the emperor to give them the lease on the land so they could look after the mausoleum. So they started burying their ancestors there. But these were gardens of hedonism, uh, etc. So anyway, it's a very interesting story, which then with Amita Beg, who was very instrumental in the project with me in formulating it, we did a book which captured all that research. And it was called the Taj Mahal Multiple Narratives. Um, I think it's now two or three years old or more maybe. I think more. Uh, and it's a very interesting document on the Taj Mahal. Uh, it's, it, it, but multiple narratives, because again, I'm sorry, this is a lecture in itself, but there were many stories about the Taj uh, which don't get told or they get told as myths which are not true, um, you know, all of that. Anyway, by just this exercise of 
taking what was a project, this was in reverse. Usually you have a project and or you have a research and it triggers off some interesting ideas of projects, which is what I showed with the Bombay work. But here it was the opposite. It was we worked for 10 years on the site management plan and conservation. And then we did it through an instrument called or an organization we formulated called the Taj Mahal Conservation, collaborated with Naveen Piplani, with Annabel Lopez, Amita, of course, was one of the principals on it and many others, uh, too long a list to name. Uh, but here we captured all of this. But what this led to was it didn't stop because being in the academy, I decided that this needed much, much more work. And with the Archaeological Survey of India and with a big team from the university, which was totally interdisciplinary with uh, all sorts of people, we embarked on a field study where we began to expand what we had learned in the book of multiple narratives as a documentation project, but with a completely different perspective of looking at the Taj Mahal and that ensemble through the river, not through the city, uh, and actually documenting it. These are Dinesh Mehta's beautiful pictures using a kite, uh, not a drone, because you could not get permissions for the drone, looking at what happened with these gardens, studying what is the landscape along the river. It's a completely different view uh, on the Taj Mahal. Uh, and the 30, the context of the context, the landscape in which, in which the Taj Mahal is situated, because it opens up a completely different understanding, not only of Agra, but also the history of the Taj Mahal itself. And so this again is an example where uh, a research project instrumentalized through a book is extended then into speculations of what might actually occur. Uh, and so these are studies of looking at archival images, looking at you know, land ownership, uh, trying to map what these gardens were, what is the present condition of many of these places. And then there were propositions by students. There were 15 propositions by students about how one can reactivate the river as the spine along which this heritage corridor is organized, which would also be related to the economy uh, of the city because Agra is among the poorest cities in India. So it actually had an urban planning ambition. But this book documents all those ideas, those projects, those research, the photography, uh, and uh, you know, and we printed about five, six hundred copies of which the Archaeological Survey of India itself took many because they were partners in this with the World Monument Fund uh, and the Aga Khan uh, uh, program at our university, uh, and it resulted in this book. So from this now, I'm kind of going to urbanism. I'm sorry, Durgananda, I might be a little over, but I'll race through it uh, now very quickly. So when we come to urbanism. Uh, which was the last thing, one was always intrigued having studied urban design where architecture as the single spectacle of the city, architecture as a stable entity was what we all learned. But one began to realize that actually architecture is not the single spectacle of the city, it's these festivals. And these are, you know, with the immersion of the Ganesh at the end, uh, Ganesh idol at the end of the celebration days, the spectacle dissolves, it leaves, it's an enacted process, it leaves no memory. It's a kinetic kind of condition. And that's what happens when those disparities of imagining the city hit the ground. Uh, it's about being incremental. So one began to formulate this idea of seeing how <clears throat> one could look at actually what one saw around uh, oneself. And this resulted in a book I did, which was part of the Michigan debates on urbanism, where we looked at uh, everyday urbanism. Margaret Crawford is a great proponent of this. And it was a debate which we captured as a book on everyday urbanism. <clears throat> at that point, I was also working on many art galleries and got invited to be one of the curators for an exhibition on Bombay in Lille uh, in France. And this was a catalog where I was the commissioner of the exhibition. And it's a catalog of artists who have worked on Bombay. So it's a completely different reading. One reading is a reading about uh, spatial occupation. And then this book or catalog is a reading uh, about uh, Bombay through the lens of artists. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have an essay in it. And then there is a selection of works by different artists, uh, which was done in collaboration with one of the co-commissioners of the Lille exhibition. <clears throat> but it's, it is a book. And then the third was a book uh, we call the Mumbai Reader. It was done when the UDRI was invited to the Venice Biennale. And I thought that um, you know Kapil Gupta uh, was uh, the person who kind of led it, and uh, an installation was designed uh, at the Venice Biennale for the Urban Design Research Institute on uh, 
uh, at that time, the development plan. Uh, and that was the first sort of, I think, surfacing of the, well, the problems or the limitations of the development plan. And Kapil Gupta did this wonderful exhibition, or a number of us did it together. Uh, and we came up with this idea that uh, what if we made a telephone book on Mumbai uh, in, or using that format? That's why it's yellow and the pages in this were yellow. Uh, and it was a compilation of everything that had been written on, on Mumbai at that, in that year uh, around these questions. And that gave rise to this idea of the Mumbai reader, uh, which now it's, I think, in its 16th year uh, uh, and formulation. But this was the first one where you know, I was at least more, um, more hands-on and more uh, engaged. And of course, the UDRI has taken that, and now it's become almost an institutional uh, document. But this was the first one. Uh, which was triggered off by the need to represent Bombay, a very complex city in a Venice Biennale uh, without bringing it down to a singular thing. And therefore it compiled many voices on the city as part of this document. And, and then one did a lot of studios. This is landscape urbanism, looked at Bombay. These are studios that I've been doing at MIT and at Michigan and at Harvard. And I've committed to myself from the time I started teaching that every studio I do, I will compile it as a document to give it back to the city. Because you know we come to the city or we go to different locations from Bhopal, we go to some village and study it. What does the village get from it? Uh, so if I bring students from the US to study Mumbai, what does Mumbai get from it? And so this becomes, this has been a kind of very disciplined endeavor to document every studio that one has done. And now this is, I think, in, the, in my 12th or 13th such publication. So this was with Alan Berger on landscape and urbanism. This was on mapping Mumbai with the students of uh, Michigan University. And once I came to Harvard, I started a CD call, series called Extreme Urbanism, where I take very difficult problems, the Back Bay in Mumbai, Dongri, uh, very high density areas, uh, and actually compile these. So now these have gone, now we are in the process of producing the seventh one of the extreme urbanism uh, series. Uh, and this is the one that is just going to press in a week, which is called Extreme Urbanism 6 and seven, six, and it is uh, on sanitation as infrastructure and looking at the idea of sanitation. And it has 15 propositions of ways that sanitation, public toilets, et cetera, can be dealt with. And the last one before I go to ephemeral is looking at the models of planning practice. So in the same way as looking at the uh, uh, models of practice within architecture, this book looks like it's with Mohammed al Hassad uh, and was funded by the Aga Khan uh, Awards, looks at planning practices because here in the discussions in the Aga Khan Awards, there was a push and I was very interested in this idea that why are we only restricting the awards to architecture? Why not to planning? We come to urban design, but what about planning? And so they commissioned us to look at what are the planning practices that we could recognize and it's called emerging models of planning practice. So the last bit of this is on ephemeral urbanism, which Durghanans, I'm sorry, I brought it down to the last five minutes, but this was a very interesting, <clears throat> So, you know, uh, talking about the kinetic city, writing about everyday urbanism, led me to feel that the Kumela had something in it that we could learn from. And it hadn't ever, it had always been documented and almost fetishized uh, by photographers. Uh, and looking at the literature review, we found that there were some serious scholarly books on the Kumela, which were by anthropologists, sociologists, books just on the women in the Qum, on you know, things like that, which were highly specialized. And then there were very popular kinds of almost comic books on the Qum. But the greatest body of work on the Qum was photographers. In fact, Raghubir, the famous Raghubir Singh, who I think was India's perhaps contemporary India's greatest photographer, did, his first book was a little square book on the Qum Mela. Uh, and since, of course, there have been many. But we said, what if you look at it as a city? Uh, and we created an interdisciplinary project at the university, prepared it, prepared for it through a seminar, had all the schools, well, not all, but six schools across uh, uh, five schools and other institutes involved across the university, uh, and embarked upon this sort of uh, research uh, to look at the Kummela and to figure out what does the, I mean, what makes this city happen? And we called it mapping the ephemeral mega city. That is, you had a mega city that was reversible and it is a mega city because 7 million people uh, actually, you know, occupy it for 55 days and maybe 120 million people really visit it. 
So it's an amazing endeavor, but what is the logic that makes it a city? Uh, and looking at it through public health, through governance, uh, through all the domains that actually make a regular city, including habitation and you know structures and uh, how is it organized in the terrain? Uh, and so they were just remarkable questions uh, which you could apply and replicate for any city. Uh, and But this is an ephemeral mega city. And so that really became the big question uh, around this book. Uh, and, um, you know, and it was a project in itself. It took uh, kind of uh, two, three years uh, to put together, uh, to understand, uh, to understand, you know, what this aggregation, so to speak, means. What is the logic of this aggregation? How does infrastructure sit here? How is it deployed? How is it reassembled? What is the material geography of the place? What is the engineering that goes uh, behind uh, an endeavor like this? Uh, you know, what is social infrastructure look like, uh, public health, um, you know, what does uh, dispensation of medicines feel like, what is the system that organizes it, what are the spectacles that define it, uh, what does it mean to have so many human beings uh, in space. Uh, and so it resulted in this book called Mapping the Ephemeral Megacity, uh, which covers all these domains, right. Uh, and of course, what was very interesting was that, that this was a book that was also translated into Hindi, uh, I might argue this might be the first book on urban planning in Hindi. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was published by the government of UP. Akhilesh Yadav himself got very interested in it because we engaged him uh, in the conversations about the Kumela and sponsored the book. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, it's interesting. I don't know what life this has taken afterwards. But the question is, what does this mean uh, in terms of research and what did we learn from it? And this is the last thing I'll show which is the research on ephemeral urbanism, because people said, oh, you studied the Kumbh Mela, but that's so particular. But one said, no, ephemeral, the ephemeral, actually we should take more seriously. Why do we, why do we make permanent solutions for what are temporary problems? And so we began to expand this rubric through our research of ephemeral urbanism. Let's look at urbanism that is also ephemeral. The Kumbh Mela, of course, is one example of it, but human beings gather uh, temporarily uh, in interesting ways and under different circumstances uh, in large numbers for many, many things. And it allows you to open up the question of flexibility, reversibility. We looked at uh, hundreds of cases around the world uh, where this was happening. And this was again, a three year project at the university. I did this through seminar classes. It expanded, it expanded into a research project. It expanded then finally into a book. And we made a taxonomy of ephemeral landscapes of religion, which is all the Hajj, uh, uh, you know, all of these amazing spectacles that happen. We looked at celebration, uh, which is also another taxonomy because these are the different circumstances under which people congregate. Uh, and, you know, Burning Man, uh, these are all about that. Then there's transactions, which is markets. You know, we can call it vending. You can call it whatever, but they're really markets uh, that appear, disappear, that retract, uh, that aggregate sometimes on Sunday. There's extraction, mining towns. They have an ephemeral dimension, which is different, which is sometimes 50 years, but they're also reversible because the resource of extraction disappears. So anything that we found, military, military camps around the world, 20 years sometimes, uh, longer sometimes, they become actually large towns in themselves. Also for refuge, refugee camps, this becomes a, a, a part of that taxonomy. Uh, and so there's a whole gamut here. And so basically our criteria was anywhere we could actually, uh, we could predict an expiration date for the settlement, it becomes part of our taxonomy uh, to study. But each of their circumstances are different and therefore you have to look at it differently so that you don't romanticize it. Otherwise we romanticize these kinds of uh, occurrences. And so this category of ephemeral urbanism became something that we began to uh, expand. Uh, we began to look at very seriously. We began to argue that theoretically it should be embedded into the discourse about urban design because components of the city should be left flexible. In fact, within the conversation of climate change, sustainability, the flux that we have through migration, all of this will be incredibly, incredibly important. And so this is the taxonomy that we developed from it. We made a catalog, which was an initial catalog. We called it the cities in constant flux, 
uh, and it was something that we actually did as an installation at the Venice Biennale, which was very interesting because in this Biennale, which makes architecture the central spectacle of the city or of our existence, uh, we actually asked the question, does permanence matter? Uh, and this entire exhibition was made out of cloth and bamboo and all the display in the exhibition fitted in two suitcases and could be rolled up you know, and taken wherever we wanted to go. Uh, and, uh, you know, it had projections, it had data, uh, and it led to a book which was called Does Permanence Matter? And it's on ephemeral urbanism, which captures this taxonomy. I'll just end with one hint about what is happening. <clears throat> and uh, what we are now looking at is through this ephemeral idea, looking at the notion of flux, actually asking the question, that where does urbanism really lie in India? Is it the mega cities or is it the 300 and or now 400 and something cities or maybe even more depending on how you define it. And so therefore in India, what is urban is the new question. And this book is, I think will go to press, I hope in two months, it's in its final stages of editing and writing. Uh, and it's a book that's called Becoming Urban. And it argues that India is really becoming urban, but what is that form that urbanism is taking? And this will be, I hope at some point we can discuss it in this forum. And then there are books about reflections. This is uh, an essay where we talked about the kinetic city as a generator of practice. It was a book that was done by ARQ. And then this resulted in what is called Working in Mumbai, which is a complete works. And it's a works of all our projects, but it's also a reflection of 30 years of work of which what I've presented to you is one component of that practice, but this book actually also comp uh, also has the architecture that results from some of these influences and with this thinking. So thank you, I took a lot of time, but uh, thank you for your patience and Durganan, now over to you. Thank you, Rahul, for that uh, <clears throat> very engaging, uh, intense yet absorbable uh, presentation, uh, a wide gamut of explorations which thematically are uh, combining, synthesizing, separating. And so I think I would go back, the, the reason there was a certain purpose, in fact, maybe there was a certain idea in beginning with the ephemeral city. And the reason was uh, more in the context of the <clears throat> quarantine that we find ourselves in, we seem to be questioning all the paradigms of urbanity right now in various ways, you know, because of the quarantine. And there with, with the adversity of climate change, uh, I would say, <clears throat> and this whole conjuring of a doomsday kind of scenario that happens, uh, somewhere, I think the ephemeral city had a sense of hope uh, that that we can look at a sense of flexibility and temporariness in the way we exist, you know, uh, versus the fetish of heavy monuments. And that was that was the reason uh, one one began with the ephemeral city, not to negate the past, but to kind of begin a questioning of the past, uh, which then can percolate down into the schools of architecture. Otherwise, what tends to happen. And I think your earlier book, uh, kind of when you categorize into global practice, regional manifestation, alternate practice, and counter modernism, when you when you allude to that, there is this hidden notion that we still, as architects, want to be form builders. You know, and one wanted to kind of collapse that uh, image, which I think a trajectory of your books does and weaves through. And uh, that was the reason uh, I requested or we discussed the idea of the ephemeral, you know, and I think if this conversation now we could kind of freewheel for some time, if it's okay with you, uh, we have the stamina and uh, if we can kind of freewheel between this notion of ephemeral, but not to, not to uh, romanticize the ephemeral, but how would you say it kind of discourses with our fetish for the permanence in the way we do urban planning, our monuments, our... Could you kind of provoke that question? You know, how does it... How does it... You, you have... Not in terms of binaries alone, but does it really make us sit up and rethink? 
on the manner in which we're going about urban planning, urban. So we were, I think your sentence that we look at permanent solutions for temporary problems. And uh, in, in this, I would rephrase it as we are probably creating permanent problems for where we could have had temporary <laughs> solutions, you know. And no, uh, in, precisely, I mean, that's really what it is. So look, <clears throat> you've given me the license of freewheeling, so I will freewheel and uh, whatever that might mean uh, and hope something comes out of it, right? Oh my God, there are many things that intersect here, correct? So first of all, I'm going to start by just saying this, that uh, in the proposition of ephemeral urbanism is uh, often misunderstood and therefore I want to clarify it, is not being offered as a solution. I'm not at all suggesting we should make all our cities as temporary entities, right? I'm only yeah. arguing or I'm only pushing back on the notion that architecture is such a spe central spectacle of our city. And therefore I'm pushing back in a way on our own selves and our own professions that uh, our obsession with, you know, I mean, as they say, for a, for, a, for a hammer, everything's a nail, right? And so for us, every solution is an architectural solution and we feel we can fix the problem. And that's why I think uh, the two things you have to be cautious about is that, uh, that this is, it's, it's, it's not a draconic um, absolute solution um, uh, to what our problems might be. It's a pushback on the, the, uh, the draconic way we kind of actually as architects even think about solutions, right? And the other thing I wanna just sort of put on the table is that we shouldn't be universalizing what even might be solutions, right? So now let me complicate it because I think that's why for me it was important to show you the trajectory because I think that allows us to complicate it, especially because the intention of your forum is to engage schools and to engage a discourse within pedagogy, et cetera, right? So here, uh, actually I'm gonna start at conservation. And uh, uh, as you saw, and you might argue uh, that my God, you were so obsessed with the monuments. You were doing books on the Victoria Terminus and on Art Deco and, you know, then you're telling me about ephemeral urbanism, what the hell are you talking about? But you know, there is a consistency and maybe that's my, should be my next project to kind of actually expand on what we're just discussing and talk about the whole trajectory and what it means. So look, for me, conservation, and I'll tell you how it actually even appears in our work. For me, conservation uh, is but an instrument of planning that helps any society modulate the rate of change, right? Uh, when a society can't take change, it actually uses conservation, historic preservation, legislation against that draconically, correct? Uh, when it can accept change, where the cultural revolution has actually programmed minds to accept it, they can get rid of completely their heritage and survive, right? Uh, and rebuild it maybe. Correct. So, so you know, we what we have done is whether it's urban design, whether it's landscape architecture, whether it's historic preservation and conservation, we've made these silos. And these silos come from pure vested interests that come out of specialization, which are monetary in nature. Correct. So that's Absolutely. like a hard fact, which is not to undermine the specialization that conservationists or planners or urban designers bring to their uh, to their skills or uh, to bear on that particular aspect. It's not to undermine that but it also limits us in the way we talk about it. So for me, now I'm gonna tell you about my trajectory in a completely different way. And I, can, I will argue that everything that I've done in all those four or five families of books I've shown you is actually consistent. So for me, conservation is an instrument that modulates change. Change occurs all the time. Uh, sometimes you have to step in and push back on change. Sometimes you have to help and facilitate making that change, right? For me, the work that we were doing in Bombay in the initial years was all about pushing back on change. We were liberalizing our economy when I started our practice. People were all referring to Singapore and Shanghai. Uh, people were thinking of how buildings in the fort area could become like the stock exchange and the Taj Hotel. Uh, the urban form would be completely destroyed. My interest in environmentalism made me see urban conservation as being critical. Uh, uh, my uh, having jumped into it and got involved in it as also an advocate 
began to see that significance itself is not static. Significance you have to construct like identity is not a found entity. It's a constructed entity and so is culture. Culture are the implicit rules in societies. We make those rules all the time. And so therefore the Kala Ghoda Association, the Kala Ghoda Festival, they didn't exist. We constructed these imaginations, right? Making the task harder for us because we were attributing new meanings and new significances to the areas while committing ourselves to keep the illusion of the architecture intact, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a temporal dimension here, correct? Now, simultaneously, when one was doing the reading of the kinetic city and all the writing that came with it, it was also about understanding flux and temporality that vendors come and incrementally start a shop and disappear and go somewhere else and a festival happens. The festival transforms the city, albeit temporarily, and then the city expands back. And there was a kind of notion of reversibility, which was also consistent in the way we were designing buildings uh, in historic districts, which were about reversibility. We were trying the best we could to bring that temporal dimension also in the way we imagine these buildings, maybe not consistently through our projects, but there were many projects where we were actually conscious about it, correct? And so then that, as that began to expand, it became the, the rubric of the ephemeral actually just is all encompassing of all of that, you know? I mean, recently there's a big debate, like let's say about IIM or debate about modern architecture in India. And, you know, Kaiwan Mehta recently wrote a very good piece where he was trying to connect all these dots and you know it's not a simple answer. Uh, so one could argue that I am. I mean, I am is very important. I mean, it's important for many, many reasons. But I think we are all feeling so strongly about it. Also, is because everything around us is changing so rapidly. Correct. Mm -hmm. In another time, we might not feel about it in the same way. That's why we didn't feel about it like that 20 years ago. If you know about its uh, its uh, its demolition or 25 years ago, we didn't even feel about the impulse to maintain it very well uh, because those pressures one. There. Right now, it's very precious, precious for various reasons. It's one of the most beautiful buildings. I'm not undermining that at all. But I'm saying you also have to read it within the context of the context, right? And that's why the rubric of the context of the context and where research, books, writing, forums like this, discussions like this become critical is because we must always be aware not only of the context we work in, which displays our sensitivity as architects, but unless we are aware of the context that, that the context of the context in which we are making those micro decisions, those decisions we'll never be confident about. Uh, and I think we'll have greater accuracy and relevance, actually accuracy is not the right word, relevance about our propositions uh, and how we can go be beyond being critical to the proposition if we understand the context of the context. And I think, uh, I, I believe at least what my contribution has been is ways to open up that conversation about what is this broader context in which you can uh, situate our work. And therefore this new work that I'm doing with Saurav Bishwas is, um, is really now looking at it nationally and seeing what is the nature of urbanism really? Uh, are we, what we are describing a myth? Uh, are we, you know, uh, and, and I think it's coming up with very interesting readings uh, of notions of flux of how you move your design pedagogy also to understand what transitional design solutions mean versus absolute solutions. That's why the sanitation work is part of that because the way India is imagining solving its sanitation problem is through absolute solutions, which is not going to work. Uh, and so that's what that book on sanitation does as a subset. But the book of the urban actually challenges what is our business as usual reading of what might be the urban in the way we define it as our imagination. So, sure. And uh, I'm sorry, is that too all over the place? You can make it no, more no, no. specific. I, th I think we will we will kind of uh, begin and then we can see where it streams. And uh, because I think what was what was significant in this whole presentation, and after hearing the presentation, I was wondering whether one could have suggested another theme, um, which could be <clears throat> later on sometime. But I think what was weaving and holding this whole thing uh, was that this can become a potent instrument of advocacy. And the instrument of advocacy then has the ability and potential to break the silo because advocacy within a silo has a little meaning or relevance. You know? So I think if, if one could, if you could uh, share with us how does this advocacy, maybe we start with the Harvard studio. So we look at it in academia. Uh, 
uh, this breaking of the silo, this crossing of disciplines, this uh, ability to weave across disciplines, which the Harvard studio on the Kumbh Mela did, uh, what kind of uh, learnings did you find from that as, as an instrument of advocacy, but, but emerging in academia? Because you do have UDRI in your own practice where advocacy emerges from practice per se. You know? And uh, now we're looking at within academia, what kind of learnings or what are the takeaways from that? Yeah. So, you know, just to clarify those differences, I mean, the UDRI, for example, at least the first 10 years of the work that I showed you was very much under the umbrella of the UDRI. A lot of it was, not all of it, but a lot of it was because I was director, I was working on the last 10 or 15 years, I have not. And there've been other people who've been doing other things and things that have grown. Uh, but for me, the last 10 years have been more with the academy. Uh, so let me say, I think in both those conditions, the learnings were quite different, right? Uh, in the first one, uh, the learning was, I mean, just realizing that these become ad instruments of advocacy in the sense that uh, you know, one was doing a lot of the writing initially, just out of the excitement of doing it. And there were, you know, all sorts of strange circumstances that led us to do those writings. Uh, and then soon one began to realize as one began to get involved in say the fort area and doing things uh, around the Kalagoda area, doing things in other places that these books actually were instruments of advocacy. If we didn't have the books, we might not have had the voice and because we had the books and these things were put down as commitments in writing, whether it was a little brochure for Ballad Estate or, you know, the catalog for buildings on Kala Ghoda, the commitment that comes with writing, the commitment that comes with print actually expands your voice uh, in a conversation. It really gives you credibility as perhaps being an expert in the field, uh, but it also, uh, it becomes a form of commitment, right? And commitments are important. I mean, talk is very cheap, right? <laughs> we can talk all the time, but uh, the commitment in writing is very critical. So the first phase in those 10 years, largely with the UDRI and doing all that work, uh, it actually showed me uh, the difference between, uh, I mean, although in some parts I was doing advocacy and making the instruments of advocacy simultaneously, but it also showed me that as things get more complex, as you begin to nuance who the client and that constituency itself is, then uh, it it would be arrogant to think you can do the instruments for advocacy and do the advocacy, which I, I think a lot of people fall into that trap actually. Mm. And so therefore one in the second phase of my work with the, when I started teaching in the academy, say from 2000 onwards or 2003 to be more precise, uh, I realized that now I had the platform to take on more complex problems. Uh, but then I also had to accept that what I would do is, really create the instruments for advocacy. I could not potentially go um, and be, you know, working at the region of the metropolitan area of Mumbai and trying to make change there because I just didn't have the presence or I didn't have the connection with the constituency. So we needed mediators. So whether it was the UDRI, whether it was the World Monument Fund and the Archaeological Survey of India, there were different people who we engaged, whether it was the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, when we did Dongri, because Dongri has one of the oldest Jamaat Khanas uh, of the Ismaili faith. And, you know, across the road, uh, there was development that was happening among the Bori community. And so therefore it was part of that context. So therefore there our constituent groups became the Ismaili community uh, uh, who we worked with. And so what we produced were seen as instruments we would give to them. And that's exactly what happened. All those books that we made, those mediators took most of those copies. They took all the material we made like models of the area, which they're using in their own quiet way to do different things. Some are using it, some are not. In the archeological survey, I even now get a call once in a while when there's a new director. I got that book, we can't find the copies. And I say, look, we gave you a thousand copies. And they say, we don't know where it's been stored. Can you send me two more? Because there were ideas there that we would like to follow up on. That's why I said, after a point, these books have their own life and one shouldn't even worry about trying to be part of that life because they really go and find their wings and they become instruments. Now, they're not finite solutions. It might inspire, as you were saying to me earlier, Durganan, the intention of this forum, it might inspire four young architects now to build on that research. And they might do another book which builds on it, right? But it's the culture that it's the archive that we have to create as a community of architects in India, which is very, very critical. Uh, and so 
What did I learn in the second phase? Just to go back. So one was between the first and the second phase, I learned this differentiation between uh, advocacy and the instruments for advocacy. I learned very much what constituencies for us mean of how one can actually deconstruct the client into the patron, into the operational client. And that all comes out of up to the work I did with Ranjit and Kaiwan, the state of architecture and housing. With the academy, it was different. It was this expansion. But what the academy taught me was that, and the Kumela is where I could articulate it the best, is that if you want through interdisciplinary work to construct these instruments, you have to define the problem in, in ways that it's wicked. That's why I call it extreme urbanism. Mm. That the problem has to be wicked enough that you would get through interdisciplinary work. Otherwise, we are all very comfortable. I mean, architects see architecture as the solution. So what was fantastic about the Kumbh Mela was we had a seminar with Diana Eck and I did a seminar across the university, which had 60 students. And they were from every school, different disciplines, all preparing ourselves to go to the Kumbh Mela. Uh, no one knew what to expect, not even the architects, who I was scared would have the arrogance to think, OK, this is what. Mm. Everyone was on the edge of their seats because they had no idea what they were going to experience. And I'm not exaggerating of the 45 or 50 people who eventually went to India uh, with me on that trip to live at the Kumbh Mela, only two had been to India before. Uh, so it was not only their first introduction to India, but to study such an out of the box problem. But you know, when we reached there, I realized in the second day that these kids who were otherwise all you know grandstanding from their own disciplinary perspective, suddenly were the most porous creatures because they desperately depended on each other to make sense of what was surrounding them. Not only right. surrounding them as, as in India, which is a complicated construct, but the idea of an ephemeral mega city because they landed there on the on Mak Makar Sankranti where the city had already been built. And so suddenly they were li living among 5 million people in what was a temporary city in tents and understanding it as an operating urban uh, ecology. Uh, and so their dependency on each other, the doctors depending on the architects, the architects depending on the engineers, the engineers depending on people from the school of divinity to understand what those ritual meant spatially, et cetera, created that interdisciplinary work and true also for the faculty. You know, um, I mean, the business school people went there with the idea they'll write a case study on it because that's their method of teaching. You know, the public health people said, okay, what are the best peer reviewed journals we could write about in this? But by the time they reached their interdisciplinary dependency, forget interdisciplinary yeah. work, interdisciplinary dependency became critical. And I, that was for me very important as a learning. And in all these studios, that's why even the studio in Agra, it wasn't taking the Taj Mahal, which would have been an obvious set, but we said, let's take the river and let's see what the landscape of 30 other pleasure gardens might mean. And how could we actually intervene? And the book actually has 15 very beautiful design propositions of how you could do that, you know. Uh, so there you, then I think you do two things. One is you, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but one is you create this forum for interdisciplinary work, which you have to, that, that's an architecture in itself. It doesn't happen yeah. naturally, yeah. correct? And therefore defining the problem becomes important. And then the other thing that I think, uh, 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 you know, uh, emerges uh, from this is that you force yourself to go from the critical to the propositional. Uh, it's, it's very easy to get stuck at the cr critical. And I think some people have to be stuck at the critical. Some people have to concentrate on the critical. But I think all of us who practice as architects uh, must go from the critical to the propositional. Otherwise, I don't think we'll have a voice in society. No, absolutely. I think the significant takeaway then, if I could just rephrase it, for the benefit of schools who want to engage with this, uh, has been the capacity, I mean, you, you labeled it well by calling it wickedness, but I think it is the capacity to subsume the different disciplines uh, that that entire problem needs to have. Uh, and that the experience, as I see it, and if I can rephrase it, the experience of being there in a certain sense provoked or inspires the interdisciplinarness, not a framework or a guideline which is preset and then you come down. I think that may not have worked. Would you 
uh, concur with that idea that the experience yeah, of no, that, that in situ no, event. Yeah, that's very well put. Then I'll actually qualify it. Uh, let me nuance it a little more. If I'm yeah. speaking to, you know, professors who are teaching at the schools of architecture. So, you know, uh, yes, I think one is to, you, you define a wicked problem, which is a problem with every solution open up other problems, right? Uh, and so you, you, it's, it's a self-propelling kind of thing, which also exposes you to the notion of uh, the instability of the planet that we live in and the way we occupy it and the life and, and life intrinsically has this sort of notion of instability. But I would also like to nuance it with something else, which is that, uh, you know, I mean, I think at Harvard University, the schools we chose um, uh, are, are professional schools. Uh, you know, so uh, if we had, let's say, so if we had architects and then we had sociologists and we had anthropologists and we had disciplines which are sort of observatory in their essential character. Uh, I mean, anthropology and sociology is also moving towards the propositional. Anthropology has made a big leap towards that. But essentially, they are rooted in observing, right? They, they will tell yeah. you the relationships that exist in society. They will not tell you, look, if you change that relationship slightly, this is what could happen. Architects do that naturally, correct? Yeah. So one of the things I'd say is that the group we took, which is the business school, the design school, the engineering school, the public health school, these are all propositional by nature. So it actually made it easier. Sure. Now, the divinity school, you could argue, is about observational, uh, you know, as part of the social sciences. But actually, our divinity school, and especially Diana Eck, she was interested in how environmentalism is intersecting with some of the faith-based practices. And so she is interested in proposition. Her project is a project of pluralism, where she's trying to see how pluralism, if a framework like that can be constructed, can actually propel us as a society globally. You know, so she is also propositional in her thinking. That made it much easier. If I had a team which was, like I said, of other disciplines, uh, which were ob observationalness in their cultural kind of disciplinary framework, it might have been a different problem. So therefore, in conclusion, it's the selection of the problem and the definition of the problem, the wickedness of the problem, as you said, but it's also the composition of, you can't just say, okay, I'm gonna put 20 people together and we'll get into this new work. It, that has to be orchestrated. So you get the perspectives that might bear productively on a set of problems which might be wicked. Absolutely. Raul, how would you think, and uh, this has influenced or woven <clears throat> into practice, uh, you have the book of practice in Mumbai, but how would you, if you were to kind of condense this vast uh, trajectory, how do you think it engaged or conversed with practice? Well, I, I don't know if my respected friend uh, Rajneesh Vatas is on this and listening to us. So I don't want to take away too much from his discussion because I know I'll get a call yeah. from him in five minutes pulling me up. Uh, but I think the question you've asked is a very important one. And that's a preview perhaps for what I might discuss with him in April or whenever we are meeting, which is, I think, um, and that's why I've called that book Working in Mumbai. I think, I think the city or the environment we work in uh, is critical to us and our formulation in terms of values, in terms of how we work, in terms of the culture we work with, in terms of how we relate to people, in terms of what we even think are the problems, how we define the problems, uh, uh, the extent of our resiliency uh, and, uh, and our aspirations. Uh, and so the city, I think, you know, going back to the context and the context of the context, I think one can nestle many things. Um, you know, so the city is, of course, our context is not like we don't know what's happening in the world, but we try to create those intersections. And so I think the place, uh, I think the place that we operate in, and I think we, and I think Charles Correa said this, he said, architecture is not a movable feast. We have made it a movable feast. Architecture is actually as like a tree that grows in the soil with its roots deep down there. Architecture has to be like that, right? Uh, I mean, it can, it can take an incredibly talented architect like Louis Kahn to come and intuitively understand that. And that's why the IAM buildings feel so rooted in their place and the way they respond to light and color and texture and material. And Corbusier did that. And, you know, as people have said, sometimes those Corbusier buildings would be more Indian than anything else. 
So I think it's it, not to confuse it with that. That is a, a question of sensibility and response and understanding the context and its context. But I think for us as human beings, as practitioners, as architects, we take the nourishment from the place we exist in. And we have to be very mindful of that. Uh, and, uh, and we have to create that synergy between the place we work in, the place we are committed to, uh, and what we can give back to it. Because as I've said in that book, the city or that place then returns that with equal generosity to your own growth. Uh, and therefore that commitment is very important. And for me, at least retrospectively, uh, the, the, the offerings that I've made to the city in return uh, with what it's taught me in terms of the books I've done, the studios I've done, the way I've tried to, and then that's why I said to you, for me, it has been a personal commitment uh, from the time I started teaching that if I'm gonna teach in the US and I'm gonna teach and look at things in Mumbai, there is something I have to leave back and it'll be this instrument. Now, whether that instrument that I leave for an NGO, for the UDRI, for the ASI, for the Ismaili community in Dongri, as wings takes traction, I, 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 I hope it will, but it's not something that I lose sleep over. Um, not because I'm not concerned, uh, but I know that these have their own natural osmosis and they become part of societies and cultures over time. And the book is successful if it can have those wings. It stays in the archives if it doesn't. Uh, and like I said, sometimes it has intangible effects, which means it inspire someone else to build on it. It sometimes inspires someone to plagiarize from it and start something using it. And that's happened to all my books and it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, it reflects on the kind of uh, lack of culture we have uh, in terms of uh, writing and the culture that surrounds the academic discussion. Uh, but for me as an instrument, that's fine. Uh, but I think the more we talk about it like this, I think more people will engage with it. And we will also develop an etiquette and a culture uh, uh, that will create a framework for us to more productively exchange our own ideas. Uh, and I think that's what we should aspire towards. Sure. Um, <clears throat> a little more focused question and uh, one could respond to it in the way you like. Uh, for the urban studio in the Indian context, whether at the undergraduate level or the master's level, uh, how would you critique it in the context of the writings you've done? You know, and uh, you could respond to it in whichever way you want. The idea is really so that at the next stage, we would like to, at the COA Social Reads Forum, uh, look at the bridge of some of these books that percolate into urban design studio, either at the undergraduate level or the postgraduate level and provoke a discourse uh, with faculty and students within the school. So it's not as if this is a dialogue and we switch off and it's done with, but there is a whole kind of unfolding that has been planned. And it's been, I would say it's, it's received a very good response. So in that, in that context, uh, what kind of critique would you have or are we missing out somewhere in the way in which urban design is done with such a, Eurocentric notion of urban form, you know, go back to the square, we go back to a certain versus a very dynamic Indian urbanism that we see. And I think you had at one point kind of created those binaries and then maybe broken the binary of the kacha and the pakka and, you know, then the intertwining of the two. Uh, so what kind of critique would you have in the context of an Indian urban studio? Well, I mean, I think, no, that's a, uh, uh, let me say it's a complicated question, uh, very important one. So I, I, I'm not undermining it in any way, but I, I don't know the black and white answer, so to speak. But I mean, I would say that, in fact, for me, again, just to go back to the ephemeral, because, you know, that's uh, what you have alluded to in very productive ways. I think uh, for me and my colleagues who worked on that, uh, the, you know, I mean, there were many people, there were students who became colleagues as Felipe Vera, there's Jose Mayoral who come from Spain and come from Chile. And, you know, so it actually resonates in many, many localities. Uh, but, you know, the whole idea of that book and that whole research was really to expand the theoretical frames by which we engage with cities, because in many parts of the world, I mean, 
you know, in, um, in what we call the majority world, where a majority of the world's population lives, or people call it the global south, but it's the majority world, suddenly human beings become very central just because of the majority of the world living there, correct? The densities in which our settlements and our countries sort of exist, right? Uh, so therefore, the parameters by which you even decide what is the spectacle of the city, what, how do you deal with memory, uh, what does even habitation mean, um, you know, what are the disruptions that you create in habitation? <clears throat> and that's why actually for me, conservation, the work we're doing in conservation intersects completely with uh, the notion of habitation or housing in a broad way, but let's call it habitation or dwelling. Uh, because uh, in fact, what I was talking to you about modulating change, uh, in fact, housing has become the most disruptive uh, uh, instrument uh, that architects are using in our society versus kind of actually upgrading, restoring, using conservation as a way to create the stability because housing has to be situated within a much more complex ecology of, 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 of livelihoods and mobility and you know all of that. So, I mean, I think these all kind of nestle into each other and one could you know actually present this whole thing through the lens of housing or through the lens of conservation yeah. or planning, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the more pointed response to your answer is that I think we have to, and this is again where I would, you know, urge the Council of Architects and things, and that's the reason why I am even now working with Saurav on this new book on uh, on uh, the, uh, becoming urban, because we have to create our own frameworks. For me, the kinetic city writing, the ephemeral urbanism writing, uh, is all part of trying to say that, and you know, I'm 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 a practitioner more than an academic, but I'm trying to say that look the ones who are in, a, in the academy, let's, let's push to create frameworks that are relevant for us. So, you know, I mean, theory comes out of reflection on what's happening on the ground. Theory is not static. Theory also is a reiterative process, correct? We are in urban design and planning, looking at theory that came out of the industrializing West and we are applying it now. Actually, the new theory should come out of China and India because this is where the urban action is yes. happening. So for me, uh, at least my writings, the aspiration is uh, not to say that this is resulting in theory, but to provoke us as a community to say, look, there are different ways of thinking about this and different ways of then writing it and then asking the question, what does that mean as a theoretical framework? So for me, kinetic city expanded into ephemeral urbanism, kinetic became ephemeral and city became urbanism as a way to expand the rubric, to test whether the same idea of the kinetic city, I could apply globally uh, through the taxonomy because those are the kinds of things we were getting discussions about. Now, how that sits in housing, I haven't solved in my mind, uh, but that is the aspiration. So let me say it's a work in progress. I don't have a definite answer for you except to urge my colleagues in the academy that look, let's ground uh, our studios in questions uh, that are very particular to the places we are looking at. And from that will emerge theory. Don't try to think that, okay, let me take this theoretical frame and see how it works in the poles of Ahmedabad or in the outskirts of Bhopal. Rather yeah. take the location and let the theoretical frame come out of reflection. So the theoretical frame shouldn't even actually hamper what you're doing. Your exploration should be based on the contingencies of the demands of that locality. And therefore, then books become a very important way. When you capture it, you reflect. And through that reflection comes a theoretical frame. Sure. In, if one were to extend that further and uh, link it to an earlier conversation we had a few years back, uh, <clears throat> and you can take the liberty to, I mean, I'm going to make, I hope I don't become preposterous in this, but I'm just trying to kind of connect it to an earlier conversation that there seems to be in the urban studios often a need to situate it, situate it in the big metros. So you would even have a small town doing a shopping mall in Bangalore or a shopping mall in Mumbai, where I think at one point you had mentioned that the real emergence or sprouting of urbanism is really happening in the smaller towns and smaller cities. And that if schools which were situated in those cities rather than uh, visualizing themselves as uh, being denied of the prime urbanism of Mumbai or Delhi, uh, re-looked at themselves as now being the real centers of that uh, sprouting. I think there would be a, a new kind of conversation with the 
trajectory that you've just defined you know uh, totally yeah. absolutely no no absolutely and just to go back to that precise suggestion uh, and i you know i i see habib on it and i see others who are influential in this realm i'll repeat that suggestion which was i think you can correct me if i'm wrong uh, was that you know yeah we should absolutely look at you know i mean according in this book that we are doing it's we've identified about 7000 you know 200 and something towns that are census towns and we've actually identified 30000 places that actually should qualify as towns right so there's a there's a kind of gap there of 23000 places right mm-hmm. which means it's about 300 million people right it's huge uh, so what we had talked about or at least what i had suggested was that one of the roles the council should play maybe the indian institute of architects but i think the council uh, now that we are on the councils forum but i mean other institutional frames is bring attention to these places and what i had suggested was one way to do it is to do the equivalent of youth hostels where uh, you know a lot of people in the bigger metropolitan students who study even if they come from smaller towns they get trapped in the luxury of the big town the comfort of the big town the connectivity of the big town uh, the fact that you can even find minimal housing in a big town uh, and you don't want to go at rafida doctors used to have that that you had to do a rural internship right and people found all forms of influence to get out of it but it taught them a great deal because the ones who did their rural internship learned about diseases and things that they would have never imagined even existed so if the council for example had youth hostels in 25 of these sort of emerging little towns and these were youth hostels that gave you safe good food had water had good internet connectivity and instead of these internships that students are killing each other to get because they don't exist uh, they actually went and did this internship in small towns and worked with panchayats and they worked with you know constituencies there they would actually in those internships build things actually if not at least influence things and they would probably build constituencies that they would go back to as practitioners right and they would g- gain the sensitivity of the aspirations of those small towns right uh, and so i mean i think those are the kinds of interventions we can make through institutional structures uh, and ngos and foundations i mean I, i don't mean to put the onus only on the council of architects or the indian institute of architects but i just mean civil society more broadly uh, that we uh, create this intersection between the academy uh, where research is produced where th- theory is constructed from but where also advocacy can happen on the ground no it will actually address many issues together sure because i would say my own critique has been that in the schools of architecture we do have uh, several students maybe even 60 or 70% coming from the small towns mm-hmm. and then who are subjected to this uh, uh the wickedness of the modern project uh where where they have to kind of uh, <clears throat> uh move out of their conditioning of the small town uh the way the curriculum is structured i know i'm being a little harsh there but i think the reality is where they lose their sense of uh, uh location coming from a small town to a big city and the way the curriculum is structured that when they go back to the small town uh they find it difficult to engage with their own community you know because of the manner in which they've gone through their five years and i think if right. a merging can happen or a kind of synthesis can happen with your idea of the hostel or or some form of uh, of uh, habitation right. in the small town as like a brain center Yeah. Uh, i think a new a new dialogue could open out in the urban design studio as well you know uh, you... absolutely and i mean i think it's 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 a combination of many things durgan it's not yeah it's of course having the yeah. facility is 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 compelling Uh, and it's a form of infrastructure right that we as an architecture community provide we realize as a society of architects that uh, or as the profession of architects that this is what we need to do how would we facilitate it so we create the social the physical infrastructure as a community of architects to do that but it also simultaneously needs means a shift within the kind of theoretical frameworks we engage with and how we expand those and particularize those for our context right uh, i mean i think generalized theory is also important uh, because from generalized theory comes more specific theory through those reflections uh, but i mean i think 
it's got to be the kind of pedagogical um, engagements in these directions that you're describing together with building the social and physical infrastructure which will help facilitate the movement and the exposure of students to uh, these places you know and you know these kinds of youth centers they could be very i mean they could be four rooms or a dormitory with a little common multi purpose space where you could actually even have exhibitions that circulate that go you know in which are educational which are, i mean all sorts of things i mean yeah. mainly we've got to bring back into the imagination of society that architecture matters architecture is important finally cities are about how they are spatially organized finally it's the containers of buildings where we live our lives is the containers of buildings where we interact with each other it's also the public spaces and the streets which is all part of the realm that we engage in but the spatial dimension of our lives is critical now uh, whether it's the covid uh, pandemic as you say suddenly even the 6 foot fit put dimension or the 10 foot dimension of distance is a special question right because then it has effects on how how we occupy space uh, and so i think the roles we play not to overplay it but is important and uh, i think uh, i think we got to just articulate our position in different ways and not be seen as just complies i mean accomplices of real estate folks building and disrupting which is what even housing and everything is doing now it's actually disrupting society uh and uh, uh in, in 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 with with the goodwill of finding solutions but we are you know looking in the wrong place for the solutions in the wrong directions and we can't look for the right solutions unless we have these frameworks which tell us what is what is the larger context in which this context we work in sits sure thank you raul for that uh uh i would say vast and amazing gamut that you traversed in the last 2 hours now that we've dialogued i would now uh invite uh, the president habib khan is there he's joined us and if he's there to kind of share his insights and you know uh, please come hi hi everyone hi rahul i'm sorry i i missed hi. a couple of minutes in the beginning i got some technical issues uh, absolutely you miss uh, very little habib <laughs> hi i hope so but i'll i'll catch it up on youtube but ex- absolutely expensive range of issues you touched raul today and uh, vast repertoire of thoughts and very intense flawless and absolutely incisive and uh, you know the the i i'm sure our audience and the academy in general would get enriched by by this by this uh, dialogue on the social reads uh, platform basically see we i mean the, the, you you raise a very pertinent point and a pertinent issue which is uh, relooking at our entire education policy the pedagogical systems and you know and and the policies that we have made for ourselves and the and one example is the internship that you have been talking about quite often and we need to you know, we're looking at expanding our horizons and uh, and and you know uh, and our field of intervention and i think it should go not only to small towns but to the rural sector the agro sector wherein we can our our students and and our young architects should actually think of uh, you know uh, expanding their their horizons and i i'm sure uh, uh, your insights and your help at the council would be uh, your help would would help the council achieve this and i'm looking forward to your uh, uh, sustained uh, contribution we're not going to leave you so soon and so early and i i have the my first my first thought uh, you know between the dialogue between you two was that it needs a series of dialogues you know <laughs> you have so much packed up into into such a short uh, little time of 2 hours i think nandan we should have a couple of <laughs> couple of dialogues with rahul you know to 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 exploit the the thoughts that he has and take it to our fraternity one thing which came to my mind and i would like and if you can answer it very quickly rahul uh you know you talked of ephemeral urbanism and you know the kumbh mela which is very interesting i have seen that book read that book is very interesting and, you know at, at the moment we are having a paradoxical existence in 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 delhi wherein uh, we are trying to rewrite uh, uh, history by making a new capital you know uh, right or wrong we're not saying that but we're rewriting history and trying to establish a permanence while there is a ephemeral uh, Uh, settlement of farmers were challenging that uh, supremacy 
So what 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 is your opinion? I think I mean it's it's also it also opens up a large uh, you know platform for our academia to study the the ephemeral settlement you know of the farmers that they are trying to uh, to prove a point. So what is your opinion on this? You know what about this paradoxical existence at the moment in the capital? Are you on mute? Travel on mute. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, Habib. Thanks for that. No, no, that's very. I mean, that's bang on in the way you framed it. And you know, this is exactly what um, uh, Durganan kind of said in passing. And I wish I had actually spoken a little more about it. Is this notion of binaries, no? Uh, Durganan, which I think you were referring to. I've always said that you know binaries are a very good way for us to organize and understand the world, but it forces you to live in one world or the other. No. Yep. So if you say public private, then you are either an architect of the public or the private. Uh, the question is, how do you actually synthesize and make these differences? Similarly, when we talk about state, I mean, I, all these binaries, I don't want to get into them. So actually, Habib, what you're actually describing is wonderful because it is the binary. It is the ultimate in the binary that is happening in Delhi right now, correct? And that's exactly what my point is when I talk about ephemeral urbanism is that our cities must make space for this, not on the periphery, but at the center. You know, in Bombay, by default, that happens. You have Chopati Beach, which gets transformed at Ganpati time, right? You have the Maidans and along Marine Drive that become venues for weddings, right? Overnight, they have weddings and they disappear and the cricketers are there in the morning, right? That elasticity of the city is what our cities need for two or three reasons, right? One is, I think it's cultural. I think we occupy space in in those ways, even culturally, we don't aspire to go into have a wedding in a in a wedding hall because we are very individualistic in our culture. We want each wedding to have its own character. So we'd rather do it in bamboo and cloth and plaster of Paris and take it out because we leave a stamp on it, right? So there's a cultural dimension. There's a dimension of climate. Our climate allows us to have lives like that, right? Uh, to have endings, to have markets, to have this, that, and the other. There's another dimension, which is now I'm expanding the scale. There's another dimension. The other dimension is that India is an actually in a state of flux. What the reverse migration uh, showed us when what 30 million people moved out in one week, it showed us how much flux there's in India. In this new book that we are doing, I mean, I would argue that there are 300 million people in India that go back and forth between small town villages and big towns which means even a housing policy should be one that should focus not on a single family, one bedroom, hall, kitchen, but it should actually do dormitories. We should have YMCA models. We will solve a housing problem much more easily in much less space. We have to rethink the typologies of housing if we accept that flux is something that happens, right? Markets. In America, the, the most celebrated thing is farmer's market, where on the Sundays, the parking lots become farmer's market. I say our whole city is like this, but we don't let our city be like that. Imagine if that, Habib, became a policy where, like we had green space and we had you know commercial and residential, we actually river, reserved 30% of our land for these impermanent uses. You know, we would not only have better forums for our cultural activities, we would have better forums for protest, we would have better forums that will accelerate our democracy, not kill it. Uh, and so, so the space matters. And so our cities have to respond to these ideas of culture, climate, economy, inequity, flux, movement, temporality. What is the urban form that allows that to happen? It is not more permanent solutions. We should just repair what we have. We have enough. I think we need to create margins in our city that will allow people to occupy it. And it will actually be economically better because when we look at the farmers, I mean, the amazing things they're doing in their settlements. Look at the Kum Mela. It's amazing what facilities you have at the Kum Mela. In fact, I always joking, not jokingly, actually, I always seriously say the 10 days I lived in the Kum Mela, I went many times to visit it, but the 10 days I lived in the Kum Mela, I lived in the cleanest Indian mega city ever. It was the cleanest city in India I've lived in, and I've lived in many cities. So, so the power, the power of this, if we can expand our imagination to accept it, is amazing. Unfortunately, the tyranny of images, and I use the word tyranny of images, is what is driving our politicians towards the forms they want to make. They want to make a Dubai, they want to make a Shanghai. It's important simultaneously, but 
don't do it at the sacrifice of the other because then you create a polarization and you live in one of those binaries which is the global city of impatient capital that's not the reality the reality is and we have to make space for this pluralism spatially uh, and and that's what i would say if we had the spaces i mean look even in a place like bombay the farmers don't get relegated to the periphery they come into azad maidan right they come to the heart of the city and they go away they don't damage anything they don't leave a trace even but in delhi also we have the ramleela grounds we have the india gate lawns yeah. the, the red yeah. fort maidans but they're not being imagined like this no they're being imagined differently right right i mean i think in fact i think the central vista should be the place for the protest <laughs> then we'll be a true democracy <laughs> in right. the heart and the center of the uh, country anyway let's not get yes, too political now. yeah yeah another yes yeah thank you uh, thank you habib ji for that uh, <coughs> yeah. summation no and you know thank you habib thank you for putting that on the because you know what you have just described i'm sorry i'm just butting in but what <laughs> you have just described by taking the farmers and the central vista is something which is very powerful emblematically in the context of the discussion we are having about what are the theories that we should be looking at the city by so thank you for framing it like that we'll have we'll have probably more uh, detailed discussion and more insightful discussion sometime for sure on on this thank particular you. specific issue thank yeah. you thank you thank you abib ji so let me close by thanking uh, rahul for that amazing trajectory that traveled 30 years in less than 2 hours and we definitely would look forward to many more of these dialogues and conversations as and when of course rahul has the time and uh, and to evolve a new set of intersections with both academia and practice and we do find that this is having an impact because after uh, <clears throat> habib ji and the council opened these forums we do find attraction and a, and a thirst to engage in this forum uh, across across india and its reach southeast asia and many other countries so it it just reflects a certain thirst and a certain void that is being uh, satiated or conversed with and uh, so the next step is really to percolate it down into the studios make it a little more tangible and uh, young architectural practices and as you also discussed rahul the idea of the architecture of practice itself you know and uh, that we don't get stuck in some outmoded uh, memory of a renaissance renaissance practice where you know we make some drawing which goes to the site i think there are now new boundaries with with the technological uh, development that's happening and also i, I would say an intercultural conversation that's happened and so i thank you once again for this conversation and we do look forward for more as it percolates down we shall write to you and uh, and see what more can happen through these engagements yeah, thank you rahul thank you habib ji again and thank you thank you rahul thank you nandan thank you thank, 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 you. thank, you, on, thank, thank you from behalf of the council of architecture both of you absolutely amazing thank you thank, thank you, you.